This PGET lesson aims to examine how genome editing technologies with a focus on CRISPR might be used to address the environmental issues we are facing. To explore how genome editing could impact our environment, we will discuss three case studies. The first case study is on agriculture, where we will see how genome editing might be used to lower the toxicity of an important food crop, cassava. Next, we will discuss an insect-borne disease case study, where we will see how genome editing might be used to engineer mosquitoes to prevent them from infecting Hawaiian honeycreepers with avian malaria. And finally, we will explore how genome editing might be used to bring back the woolly mammoth in our de-extinction and permafrost preservation case study. But first things first, what is genome editing? Genome editing is a type of genetic engineering used for making specific and targeted changes to an organism's own DNA. One of the genome editing techniques that has generated the most excitement due to its efficiency and ease of use is called CRISPR. Originally discovered in bacteria, CRISPR is now being used as a tool with applications in many areas, including medicine, agriculture, and the environment. For more information on the use of CRISPR and related genome editing tools in human health, please see PGED's lesson plan, Genome Editing and CRISPR. To introduce the first case study on cassava, we would like people to consider the following scenario. Imagine you live in a rural village and your relatives are suffering from Konzo, a disease that causes paralysis. You rely on a plant called cassava as your main source of food. Cassava naturally produces a toxin. At high concentration, this toxin can make people sick with conzo. However, soaking the cassava in water for a couple of days before eating it prevents this problem. Scientists have proposed to genetically alter the cassava plant to make it less dangerous. You wonder whether providing a clean source of water, such as a well, to your village could be a better solution. What are the questions you have for the scientists about their plan? You may want to pause here to think about your own answer to this question. Answers to this question vary, but typically include questions along the lines of What if the genetic alteration makes cassava less safe? Will the alteration of the cassava plan truly fix all the conzo related problems that the villagers are facing? And will people who are already poor be asked to pay for the altered cassava plant seeds? Cassava is an important crop for over 800 million people worldwide. It is a high calorie food that can grow in nutrient poor soil and tolerate drought. Increasingly, the use of cassava is gaining popularity across the world. You may be familiar with cassava products such as tapioca or the bubbles in bubble tea or boba. Cassava plants naturally produce a toxin that can cause conzo, a disease that leads to paralysis and can potentially be deadly. This is particularly problematic when cassava is grown in drought conditions. However, there are different approaches for avoiding conzo. First, soaking cassava in water for several days reduces the plant's toxicity. And second, eating a protein-rich diet can help the body to break down the toxin more effectively. While these solutions may appear to be relatively simple, their implementation can be difficult due to systemic and historical barriers. In parts of Africa where conzo is prevalent, for example, European colonialism has left behind extreme poverty. Access to water and protein-rich foods is scarce, and people who are affected by paralysis are often not able to make the trip to the nearest river or well to collect the water needed for soaking the cassava. Moreover, waiting several days to soak cassava is not possible for people who are urgently hungry. This is why Konzo is considered a disease of poverty. Furthermore, Konzo maintains the cycle of poverty as people with the disease lose the ability to work and collect water. 
So how might genome editing help improve health and reduce disease for the people who rely on cassava? There are two genes that are responsible for the toxicity of cassava. Scientists have proposed using CRISPR to make specific changes to these genes with the goal of reducing the plant's toxicity. One major advantage of using CRISPR is that it is much faster than traditional breeding methods. Furthermore, CRISPR technologies can be applied to local varieties of the cassava plant, thus maintaining characteristics of the plant that make it well suited to the region where it will be grown. Scientists and communities are considering the risks and benefits of using genome editing to lower cassava toxicity. For example, the cassava's toxicity appears to be correlated with its ability to tolerate drought, as the drier the circumstances are, the more toxin the plant produces. Could the edits negatively affect the plant's drought tolerance, which is a beneficial trait for growing in many regions across the globe? Furthermore, cassava's toxicity is thought to provide a defense against insects. Could the edited cassava plants require farmers to use pesticides in order to grow their crop? And lastly, what will be the economic implications? Who will own the plants as well as the seeds of the edited cassava? Will farmers be able to afford this new crop? And stepping back further, Konzo is a disease of poverty, with lack of access to water and protein-rich food being the main contributors. Should disease pre prevention efforts focus on a genetic solution, or should the focus be on breaking the cycle of poverty that is at the root? Or maybe a combination of approaches is the best way forward. While genome editing offers a possible solution to this problem, careful consideration is needed to determine if it is the best solution and whether the potential benefits outweigh the risks. As an introduction to the second case study, please consider the following scenario. Imagine you are a scientist. You are visiting an island where a species of birds is in danger of extinction because they suffer from a disease that is given to them through mosquito bites. You think that the best way to rescue the bird is to use genome editing to wipe out the mosquitoes on the island. You know that the people who live on the island need to be partners in this project. How do you establish such a partnership? What is the information you need to gather from them and what is the most important information for you to share? What are you looking to learn? You may want to pause here to think about your own answers to these questions. Typical responses that we hear about establishing a partnership includes things like setting up a lab in the affected area, hiring staff from the island who can provide local expertise, and hosting a series of meetings to have dialogue with the general public. With regards to information exchange and who to include in conversations, people typically recognize that engaging local communities is important from an ethical point of view, to build trust between scientists and the public, and to ensure informed consent for projects going forward in their environment. Furthermore, Community partnerships can bring to the table diverse types of local knowledge, which can lead to the development of better strategies for addressing the problem at hand. Hawaiian honeycreepers are colorful birds that are culturally important to the indigenous people of Hawaii. They are at risk of extinction, in part because their habitat is being destroyed by human activity. Another threat to the survival of these birds are mosquitoes, that carry an avian form of malaria. Avian malaria is a bird disease caused by parasites that spread to the honeycreepers through mosquito bites. Since the introduction of mosquitoes and avian malaria to the Hawaiian islands in the 1800s, honeycreepers have been forced to live at higher altitudes where the temperatures are too low for the mosquitoes to survive. However, to gather food, the birds have to travel into the valleys where they are at risk of malaria infection. With average annual temperatures increasing in Hawaii, mosquitoes are now able to survive at higher and higher altitudes. This is shrinking the honeycreeper's habitat even further and bringing them to the brink of extinction. 
So how might genome editing help prevent the Hawaiian honeycreepers from growing extinct? Editing the DNA of mosquitoes could be used to prevent them from infecting Hawaiian honeycreepers with avian malaria. One suggested approach is to introduce a genetic trait in the mosquitoes that would greatly reduce and possibly fully eliminate the mosquito population. A second approach is to introduce a genetic trait in the mosquitoes that would make them unable to carry the avian malaria parasite, so they can no longer transmit the parasites to the honeycreepers. The challenge of introducing these genetic traits into the population of mosquitoes living in the wild is that under normal sexual reproduction, the trait will only be passed to about 50% of the next generation. This means that the trade would not spread very widely in the Hawaiian mosquito population. To address this problem, a genetic technology known as a gene drive could be used to increase the likelihood that a genetic trait will be passed to the next generation. In this way, a gene drive allows for a specific trait to quickly spread in a population. With the advent of CRISPR, the gene drive approach has become a practical reality. So let's have a look at some of the major questions and considerations with regards to using genome editing to prevent the extinction of the Hawaiian honeycreepers. First off, which genetic trait would be the most beneficial to introduce into the wild mosquito population? One that would greatly reduce and possibly eliminate the mosquito population? Or one that would prevent the mosquitoes from carrying the avian malaria parasite? Given that the mosquitoes are not native to Hawaii, wiping them out could be considered as a reset button, one that would also prevent these mosquitoes from transmitting other diseases to wildlife as well as humans. However, what if the mosquitoes have become an integral part of the ecosystem during the roughly 200 years that they have been present in Hawaii? What if other species are now dependent on the mosquitoes for their survival? Another consideration is whether the gene drive could have far-reaching effects. For example, a gene drive targeted to wipe out the local mosquito population in Hawaii could end up driving the species to extinction across the globe. Because of this, scientists are trying to design built-in safety mechanisms to limit the effects of the gene drive to the target species, or even to reverse the gene drive if unintended consequences arise. As different approaches are being considered to prevent the Hawaiian honeycreepers from going extinct, the worthwhile benefits as well as the reasonable risks need to be weighed. These are questions that require strong partnerships with communities to gather diverse expertise, such as knowledge of local entomology and epidemiology, as well as local social structures and politics. As an introduction to the third case study, please consider the following scenario. Imagine you are a farmer in Siberia, tending animals and vegetables on your land. You heard that a team of scientists are hoping to bring the woolly mammoth back from extinction. These animals once roamed exactly where you live. How do you feel about this plan? And what are your questions about it? You may want to pause here to think about your own answers to these questions. The responses we typically get to this scenario range from excitement about the idea that the display of a woolly mammoth that someone might have seen in a natural history museum might come to life, to skepticism about the intent of this project, and concern about the possibility that indigenous people living in areas of the world where woolly mammoths used to roam, such as Siberia, Alaska, Canada and Greenland, are not part of the decision-making process and stand to lose more and more of their land. The scenario on the previous slide describes the idea of de-extinction. De-extinction is the process of reviving an extinct species or creating an organism that resembles an extinct species. Genome editing tools have made this a possibility that some people are interested to consider. And the animals shown on this slide are all currently the focus of various de-extinction projects. One of the reasons mammoths are being considered for de-extinction is the potential role they could play in slowing the thawing of permafrost. 
The permafrost is a layer in the ground that remains below 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius for at least two years in a row. Permafrost is found in areas where the average temperature rarely gets above freezing, on land as well as below the ocean floor. As average global temperatures rise, the total area of permafrost is shrinking. Thawing of the permafrost is a particular concern because the frozen soil stores significant amounts of carbon. This carbon is released in the environment in the form of carbon dioxide and methane, two greenhouse gases that trap infrared radiation near the Earth's surface, and therefore could accelerate the rise of average temperatures around the globe. Furthermore, in regions such as Alaska, where 85% of the land has permafrost, the infrastructure is increasingly affected as the solid frozen foundations disappear. And considering that permafrost is thought to contain frozen and preserved bacteria and viruses, the concern is that these pathogens might revive when the permafrost thaws and could thereby introduce diseases into the world for which we have no natural defenses or treatments. So how might thawing of permafrost be slowed or perhaps even reversed? One idea to protect the thawing permafrost is to undertake a massive effort to return the current tundra and taiga landscapes of the Northern Hemisphere to grasslands that used to cover this region thousands of years ago. During the short summer, grasslands keep the ground cooler as their light colors reflect sunlight more effectively than the dark colored shrubs and trees of the tundra and taiga respectively. During winters, large herds of grazers such as deer, horses and bison in the grassland biome keep the ground cooler. Grazing herds of herbivores disrupt the snow cover as they look for food underneath. This compaction and removal of snow exposes the ground below to the cold winter air, which prevents the permafrost from thawing and may even expand this frozen layer. To test the idea that recreation of these grasslands could prevent thawing of permafrost, researchers have gathered a number of grazing animals, such as elk, musk oxen and reindeer, in a 5,000 acre reserve called the Pleistocene Park in Siberia. Preliminary data suggest that this effort does indeed lower the ground's temperature and slows the thawing of the permafrost, keeping more of the greenhouse gases trapped in the frozen soil. While encouraging, this effect would need to be translated on a much larger scale to combat the thawing of permafrost globally. Large herds of big grazers would be needed to disrupt the mossy tundra and forested taiga landscapes and recreate the grassland biome of the past. And a key animal in this landscape was the woolly mammoth. Could the extinction of large woolly mammoth herds recreate the vast grasslands of the past and help to preserve the permafrost? A leading strategy in the de-extinction of woolly mammoths is using CRISPR to introduce some genetic traits from woolly mammoths into the DNA of its close relative, the Asian elephant. In other words, the goal of the woolly mammoth de-extinction project is to create a cold-resistant woolly elephant, sometimes called a mammophant. Though a number of technical hurdles remain, this project was able to get underway because of three things. One, the discovery of preserved mammoth DNA. Two, the existence of a close living relative of the mammoth, the Asian elephant. And three, the availability of genome editing tools such as CRISPR. By analyzing preserved mammoth DNA, scientists have been able to identify the genes that are responsible for key traits that help the mammoth survive in cold climates. These traits include longer hair, more fat under the skin, and a circulatory system adapted to cold temperatures. Using CRISPR, researchers are introducing these traits into Asian elephant cells in a laboratory setting. This is possible because Asian elephants and woolly mammoths are closely related, sharing 99.96% of their DNA. To make a mammophant, hundreds or maybe thousands of genome edits are likely needed. Still, if this project is to go forward, several steps and challenges lie ahead. Once the Asian elephant cells have been edited, thus creating mammophant cells, 
These cells could then be used to generate a mammophant embryo. That embryo could then be transferred into the uterus of an Asian elephant with the goal of starting a pregnancy that would give rise to a baby mammophant. The Mammoth de Extinction Project is very much in its infancy. Besides some of the technical challenges discussed in the previous slide, there are a number of ecological and ethical questions to consider as well. First off, is it acceptable to use the Asian elephant, an endangered species, in this project? There could be risks to an animal used as a surrogate to carry a mammoth in pregnancy. Researchers working on this project have suggested the use of an artificial womb to eliminate the surrogacy issue. However, this technology is still in its infancy and could not yet support the development of a mammoth to term. Further concerns exist around the use of Asian elephants in raising the mammoths after they are born. Elephants are very social animals, and the social effects of this project on both the Asian elephant and the mammoths are unknown. For example, how would we ensure appropriate rearing and socialization of the mammoths, which will provide them with the necessary skills to live in mammoth herds and survive cold climates? How would the Asian elephant herd be affected when baby mammoths are introduced, or when those mammoths are subsequently removed from the herd to inhabit colder northern climates? However, this project may also yield unexpected benefits for preserving the Asian elephant. When scientists working on the mammoth de extinction project heard about a strain of herpes virus that is deadly for Asian elephant calves, both in captivity and in the wild, they begin an effort that may lead to a cure for this disease. Another important question is where would the newly de-extincted animals live? There are people currently living in the tundra and taiga landscapes where the mammoths are suggested to be introduced. How will their voices be weighed in this discussion? specifically the voices of indigenous peoples in these regions who, throughout history, have seen their claims to land being stripped away. And if mammoths are introduced, how would they impact the local ecosystems? There are some examples of success when an animal is reintroduced to its habitat. However, given that mammoths have been extinct for several thousands of years, it is hard to know what their impact might be. Should we proceed when the consequences of introducing newly revived species into a wild ecosystem might have outcomes that are hard to predict? And lastly, do we have an obligation to try any and all efforts to prevent thawing of the permafrost, even if those efforts are expensive, have a high risk of failure, could disrupt existing ecosystems and biomes, or require the use of endangered animals? How do we balance the risks of proceeding with this project with the risks of not proceeding if there is a chance, however small, that the mammoths could play a role in preventing the release of carbon from the permafrost? Throughout this lesson, we have explored various ways in which genome editing technologies might be used to address the environmental issues we are facing. The case studies show how genome editing technologies may hold promise for solving health and environmental problems, but they also highlight some of the complex ethical and ecological perspectives. As risks and benefits are weighed, the need for strong partnerships with the communities that are impacted by the work is key in gathering the diverse expertise that is required for developing a successful strategy for the problem at hand.